Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Let's sing again. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true, change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Oh, we're going to sing that again, change my heart, oh God. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true, make it ever true, change my heart, change my heart, oh God, may I be like you, Lord, may I be like you, oh, we know this.
David, wherever you're watching from, we give you we all the glory. Precious Holy Spirit, as your people gather from around the world to receive a touch of your power, I pray tonight that their faith would be stirred. And as you're watching right now, whether you're watching live or on the replay, I want you to begin to thank Jesus for what he's about to do in your life. Whether you're watching and you need a healing in your body, Perhaps you've been suffering with a sickness, a pain, a disease for several years and you've lost all hope. Perhaps you're believing God to set you free from a mindset, from a stronghold, from a demonic attack. You're believing tonight for your peace of mind. Whatever it is you need the Lord to do for you, He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or even imagine. So I want you right now to lift your hands, close your eyes, and just forget about all those things that are troubling you in this world right now. And allow the Holy Spirit to lift your heart to heaven and cause you to forget about all of those things that tether you to the cares and the concerns of this world. Hands lifted, eyes closed. You are Alpha and Omega. Can we sing that again, Steve, softly? You are Alpha. You are Alpha. Tell them, church. And Omega. It's the presence of the Holy Ghost. We worship you, our Lord. You are worthy to. give you all the glory. Sing it out from the depths of your spirit. We give you One more time, we give you all the glory. Welcome to this online healing and deliverance communion service. I want you as you're watching right now to allow your faith to soar because I believe that you're about to experience the miracle working power of God. Whether you're watching this live or whether you'll watch the replay later, it doesn't matter because that tangible touch of the Holy Spirit's power is present to work in your favor. And so I want you to write this in the comment section. I can actually see some of the comments as they come in. I want you to write this in the comment section, watching live or replay. Write, something good is going to happen to me. Just make that comment as a declaration of your faith. I want you to step out and be bold. Get your hopes up. Believe God for the impossible. For nothing is impossible with God. And also, if you're able... I want you to prepare the elements for the communion that you'll be taking in just a few moments. I want to minister a word 
that I believe will stir your faith. And as you begin to hear what the scripture has to say in regards to the communion or the covenant meal with God, I believe that as you hear what the scripture has to say, your faith will be strengthened, your hopes will rise, and you'll be bold enough to dare to believe God for a miracle touch right here, right now. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So I want to share this message with you. In a few minutes, you will be sharing a meal with God. The scripture refers to this principle, to this reality of what is known as the covenant meal. And that's really what communion is. So go right now, take your Bibles. I'm going to minister this teaching. And then we're going to pray and believe God to touch your life in a fresh way. You're going to be taking communion, as I said. And then we're going to release the power of the Holy Spirit to heal, to deliver, to empower, and so forth. Luke 22, 19 and 20. This is what the Bible says. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Now, communion is a simple spiritual act with profound implications. Communion is communing with God, fellowshipping with God. The bread in communion represents the body of the Lord, which was broken for you and I. This is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, where the scripture says, He personally carried our sins in His body so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By His wounds you are healed. Of course, we know also that the wine represents the blood which was shed for our sin. Ephesians 1, 7 says, He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom with blood, with the blood of His Son, and forgave our sins. Now, I don't know if that reverb, gentlemen, is on the live stream. If it's just here in-house, that's fine. The timing of the Last Supper is key because it coincides with the Passover, Luke chapter 22, verse 8 says this, Jesus sent Peter and John ahead and said, Go and prepare the Passover meal so we can eat it together. So this Last Supper takes place at the time of Passover. And the principle of Passover, meaning the, the story of God's redemption for the nation of Israel, that principle was established before the Last Supper. It was the Passover meal. Israel was enslaved by the Egyptians. They were in bondage. Now, we know, prophetically speaking, that Israel being in bondage to Egypt is a picture of what it means to be in bondage to sin. And, of course, God sends a deliverer, and we understand those spiritual dynamics. But God brought Israel out of Egyptian slavery with demonstrations of power. Of course, we know he sent the plagues, and one of those plagues was an angel of death that was sent into the land of Egypt, and the Israelites were given instructions on how to survive this plague or this supernatural act of God that came into the land of Egypt. Go right now to Exodus chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. On that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son, and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. And again, that's Exodus chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. So that was the Passover, the people of God surviving that wrath, that plague that came into the land by spreading the blood over the doorpost. And when God saw the blood, he would cause the angel of death to pass over 
the home that was protected by the blood. And this Passover event coincides with the Last Supper. Of course, we know the Bible is painting for us a prophetic picture of who Christ truly is. But this is more than a parallel of timelines. This is a parallel of spiritual realities. Consider, for example, the unleavened bread. Exodus chapter 12, verses 14 and 15 say, this is a day to remember. Each year from generation to generation, you must celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. This is a law for all time. For seven days, the bread you eat must be made without yeast on the first day of the festival. Remove every trace of yeast from your homes. Anyone who eats bread made with yeast during the seven days of the festival will be cut off from the community of Israel. Well, the unleavened bread here was symbolic for Christ himself. For the scripture says in John 6, 35, Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Consider also, for example, the spotless lamb. Exodus 12, 5 and 6. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep and from the goats, or from the goats, and ye shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Well, John 1, 29, a very popular verse says this, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Think also of the fact that the Lamb's bones were meant to not be broken. Exodus 12, 46 says, Each Passover lamb must be eaten in one house. Do not carry any of its meat outside, and do not break any of its bones. John 19, 33 and 34 reveals that this was also a prophetic parallel to Christ. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water flowed out. Now, the events of the crucifixion overlap with many of the events of Passover. There's a, there are many parallels here. That would be an entire lesson unto itself. But it's the sacrifice that we acknowledge when we take Holy Communion. That prophetic picture, that shadow, now fulfilled in the substance of who Christ is and what he lived out. But I want you to think about the fact that these two meals have one meaning. These two meals represent that covenant meal with God. Now, in ancient Middle Eastern culture, a meal was sometimes a means by which a covenant was finalized and sometimes a means by which reconciliation was marked. The covenant meal was used to seal the covenant and bring reconciliation. The covenant meal actuates the covenant like a signature. Think of Abraham and Melchizedek. When they shared a meal and an oath, you can reference that in Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20. Think about the fact that Abraham shared a meal with God. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Now, that was a promise made by God to Abram at the time. His name was Abram. It wasn't until about 14 years later that that promise was fulfilled. And it was fulfilled after the events in Genesis chapter 18, where the Bible says, beginning at verse 1, The Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. One day, Abraham was sitting at the entrance to his tent during the hottest part of the day. He looked up and noticed three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran to meet them and welcomed them, bowing low to the ground. My Lord, he said, if it pleases you, stop here for a while. Rest in the shade of this tree while water is brought to wash your feet. And since you've honored your servant with this visit, 
Let me prepare some food to refresh you before you continue on your journey. All right, they said, do as you have said. So Abraham ran back to the tent and said to Sarah, hurry, get three large measures of your best flour, knead it into dough and bake some bread. Then Abraham ran out to the herd and chose a tender calf and gave it to his servant who quickly prepared it. When the food was ready, Abraham took some yogurt and milk and roasted meat and he served it to the men. As they ate, Abraham waited on them in the shade of the trees. So there we see, again, Abraham sharing a meal. Now, this is what's beginning to actuate those promises. That covenant made was finalized, actuated, triggered by the covenant meal. Jacob prepared a meal for his father Isaac in order to activate the birthright blessing. That's Genesis 27, 25. Jacob made a treaty with Laban. That's Genesis chapter 31, verse 43. They made that treaty over a meal. Think about the fact that Moses and the elders of Israel had a meal with God as they formed a new covenant. You can read that in Exodus 24, verses 7 through 13. When you share a meal, biblically speaking, a cup and bread with someone in this way, you are making a covenant, a solemn binding. Communion is that acknowledgement of God's covenant. It's more than just drinking some juice and eating a piece of bread. It's more than just a meal of the natural. What you are about to participate in is a covenant meal with God. You're going to have dinner with God. Think about that. And there's something about communion. There's something very deep and spiritual that causes your faith to be stirred. That causes that acknowledgement of the covenant that we have with him. The one that Christ purchased with his own blood. Think about the fact that all covenants have terms. Meaning a set of rules by which those who engage in the covenant or enter the covenant will abide. Well God set the terms of the new covenant. Every covenant has an oath. Usually it's two parties promising something. And therefore agreeing to those terms. But because you and I, as a species, broke every covenant that God ever tried to make with us, Jesus came to earth as a man. And God came to this world, creator, stepped into creation, became one of us so that he could turn around, shake hands with himself, and complete that deal. So Jesus fulfilled that covenant on our behalf. And the triggering event of this covenant was the shedding of his blood. Just like all covenants are activated by something, a signature, a meal, the shedding of blood, a sacrifice, there's a triggering event in every covenant. That was the shedding of the blood of Jesus, which sealed the covenant between you and God. You can say, thank you, Jesus. Write that in the comment section, whether you're watching live or on the replay. Just write, thank you, Jesus. Now, If the covenant was confirmed by the blood of Jesus, why then do we still take communion? There are three biblical reasons. I'll give them to you now. First of all, we take communion, number one, to remember. Luke 22, 19 and 20, I'll read it again. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Jesus very clearly here in verse 19 says, do this in remembrance of me. When you and I take communion, we are setting our minds to remember and to acknowledge That Christ died for our sins. The precious blood of Jesus shed for you and I. The precious blood of Jesus triggered that covenant. That you and I could not keep. That you and I would break were it up to us. Christ himself walked upon the earth with sinless perfection. Never once disobeying. Never once sinning. Never once straying from the path of holiness. Jesus walked in that perfection. And he himself closed the deal on behalf of mankind. That's why he had to come as a man. 
so that he himself could complete that covenant. And now, by putting our faith in Christ, you and I are partakers of that covenant. Christ stands in perfection. You and I stand in Christ. Christ stands in authority. You and I stand in Christ. Christ stands in God's honor. You and I stand in Christ. Now, when God looks at the cross, he sees your every mistake. He sees your every sin. He sees your flaws. He sees your iniquity. He sees your wicked thoughts. He sees your wicked intentions. He sees your secrets. Everything about you that violates his holiness, he put it on the cross. And when he put that on the cross, he crucified that sin with Christ. And now when God looks at the cross, he sees everything about sinful humanity. But when God looks at you, He sees the perfection of his son, Jesus. That is imputed righteousness that is only by the grace of God. Only because of his love did he do such a wonderful thing. Only in his mercy could he have done such a wonderful thing. And now by placing our faith in him, we stand in Christ and God credits to us the accomplishments of Christ. God credits to us the perfection of the Savior. That's what took place on the cross. A great exchange happened. We are now partakers of a covenant that we did not purchase. We're partakers of a covenant that we could not have closed ourselves. We're partakers of a covenant that is founded upon the oath of God. The word that God promised in that new covenant is ours for the taking. Because God is not a man that he should lie. And all he requires of us, all he requires of us is only believe. Only believe. Simple faith. Place your faith in Christ. So we take communion to remember this. To be thankful for what he did. To honor him. To appreciate him. To realize when he shed his blood, it wasn't just the physical pain that he had to endure. Think about what was resting on the Savior in that moment. When Christ was crucified, it was the weight of of all sins, for all time, for all people, resting on his shoulders. Well, think about that. All of the guilt you've ever felt in your life. Think of those things that cause you great shame. Think of those things that cause you to cringe when they come to your memory. And and there's this great shame and guilt tied to the memory of some of those sins. Think about the fact that the weight of all guilt for all time, for all people... The shame for all sins, for all time, for all people. The heaviness, the weightiness, the consequence for all sins, for all time, for all people resting on him in that moment. He endured that. He endured that for you. You were that joy that was set before him. You were the reason he laid it all down. That speaks volumes, not necessarily of our value, but of God's great mercy. And that's what we acknowledge when we partake of communion. So number one, it's to remember. Number two, it's to reverence. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread, and verse 24 says, and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed. There we see the covenant, the signature of the covenant. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. There the scripture says as often as you drink it. So it's something that we are to be doing regularly. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death Until he comes again. In a very interesting way. 
When you and I partake of, of communion, we are moving beyond the boundaries of the natural world. And we are, by faith in the Spirit, stepping into a moment. And we do this out of reverence for him, because he's our precious Lord, because he's deserving of it, because of what he laid down, because he humbled himself, now he's honored, because he died the death of a sinner, he's raised to life as a savior. We honor him and we reverence him in these moments. And number three, so first to remember, three to, two to reverence, Three, to reconcile. Now, John chapter 21, verses 3 through 17 say this. And this, by the way, is after the Lord's resurrection. Remember, Peter had betrayed Jesus. And now this takes place after the resurrection. I'm sure Simon Peter was still filled with guilt for having betrayed the Lord, denied that he even knew him. John 21, 3. And maybe that's where you are, actually. Maybe you just don't, don't feel like approaching the Lord because you're so weighted by your own mistakes. And you don't even want to approach him because you just sense this great shame. Well, look at how the Lord responds. Verse 3 of John 21. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. He went back to what he had done before. We'll come too, they all said, the disciples. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. This is a callback to the moment that Christ first called them. Well, think about it. When Jesus called these disciples... Simon Peter, it was a very similar occurrence, a very similar circumstance where he was called by the Lord. Cast your nets again, again. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. They knew it because their nets were full now. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, jumped into the water, and headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat, And pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about a hundred yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Think of the humility of Christ to do this for them. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went abroad, went aboard, and dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Verse 12 of John 21. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Verse 13. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time, he asked him, Simon, son of John, Do you love me? And the Bible says, Peter was hurt that Jesus asked that question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Now remember, as I mentioned a moment ago, this was kind of a callback to when the disciples had first been called by Christ. It was as if he was saying, this is a fresh start. Cast your nets again, again. And for every time that Peter had denied Jesus, Jesus asked him a question. It was that love that he had for Jesus, that love that Jesus had for him, that reconciled them over what? A covenant meal. Here we see reconciliation taking place as they eat together. 1 Peter 4.8 says, 
Most important of all, continue to show deep love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Psalm 23, 5, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. It's interesting to me that people read Psalm 23, 5, and they use it as like a taunt against what they call their haters. God prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You're going to watch me be blessed. You're going to watch God do wonderful things in my life. You're going to stand by in your jealousy, and you're going to feel the pain of seeing me be blessed by God and have his favor. No, that's not what the scripture is talking about. It's reconciliation. It's not a taunt against your enemies. It's reconciliation. Thou preparest a table. This is the covenant meal in the presence of mine enemies. So communion can be used for reconciliation. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 26 to 30 say, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye shall show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, this is where people get a little concerned. They say, oh, so I shouldn't take communion if I've sinned. Or I shouldn't take communion if I'm not necessarily living right. Now, you don't want to abuse communion, but I'm going to show you something in just a moment here. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Key phrase here, not discerning the Lord's body. That's a very key phrase. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, or as the scripture is speaking of there, some have even died. Now, what does it mean to not discern the Lord's body? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This is just now the chapter before. Verse 17, watch this. For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Church. To not discern the body of the Lord. To take the communion unworthily doesn't mean that you made a mistake and now you can't take communion. What the scripture is talking about here when it says not discerning the body of the Lord is division with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. It's bitterness against the other children of God. It's unforgiveness that we hold against fellow believers. That's what the scripture is talking about when it mentions drinking or just not discerning the body of the Lord and drinking damnation unto ourselves. Why? Because the communion is covenant. The communion unites us. And, and to participate in that ritualistic portion of it without living in the reality of it is to break that fellowship. Why? Because we're not just in, co co in covenant with God, we're in covenant with each other. And the Bible says here that you do this unworthily, many are weak and sick, and some have even died. Biblically speaking, it's right here. Many times people have sickness and disease in their body because they have unforgiveness in their heart. They're breaking that covenant. Well, read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 22. The verses that preceded what we read about drinking damnation unto yourself. It talks about the fact that there are divisions. It talks about the fact that some are going hungry. They're not discerning the body of the Lord because they are carrying bitterness and unforgiveness in their heart against fellow believers. Psalm 41, 9 says, Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Who's this talking about? Judas. Why was Judas damned? Why, why did he walk in that, that wrath? Judas shared a covenant meal and then broke that covenant meal. He broke that covenant by betraying the Lord. You say, well, didn't Peter do the same? Yes, but Peter was restored through repentance. When we have communion... We are having a meal with God and coming into agreement with the covenant. That agreement produces faith. That faith activates God's promises. But when we do so, we must discern the body of the Lord. And to discern the body of the Lord means we must keep the covenant 
between both God and man. Just the pad, please. It means we must discern the body of the Lord. That means we have to be reconciled to our brothers and sisters. So, number one, we take communion to remember. Number two, we take communion to reverence. And number three, we take communion to reconcile. To take it unworthily doesn't mean, oh, I made a mistake and now I can't participate. To take it unworthily means that you're carrying bitterness in your heart while you do it. Why? Because that's to break covenant. But as we participate together in taking communion, we must remember that we are activating our faith in this deeply spiritual act. It is more than just a ritual. You are acknowledging the sacrifice of Christ, you are sharing a meal with God, you are communing with him when you do this. You will sense his presence in the room with you as you take this communion. You will sense his presence in the room with you as you partake of communion. Now, I want you to prepare those elements. Some of you have, you have your drink, you have your bread. I want you to get that ready right now. And I want you to forget about all of those things that are troubling your mind. I want you to forget about all of those things that are distracting you. Just close your eyes. Lift your hands. And focus on him. Jesus, we honor you. First Peter 2.24. Eyes closed as you have those elements before you as I read this scripture again. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are are healed. We thank you, Lord, for your body that was broken for us. We thank you for offering it as a sacrifice. We honor today the precious body of the Lord. Thank you. Just say thank you. Now, when you're ready, you may partake of the bread. We know also that the wine represents the blood. Ephesians 1, 7. I can sense such a strong anointing here. And I'm telling you, people are about to be healed and delivered even as you take this communion. <sighs> Release that unforgiveness even towards yourself. And let your faith come alive in this moment. You are sharing a meal with God right now. You're sharing a meal with God. He's in the room with you. Ephesians 1, 7. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sin. What can we say but thank you, Jesus? What can we say but thank you, Jesus? And now I want you to close your eyes as you hold that cup. And Stephen Moctezuma right now is going to sing a song. And as he sings this, he and his team, I want you in your own timing to partake of that cup. With your eyes closed, your mind focused on the Lord. I want you to begin to repent. I want you to begin to forgive. And I want you to begin to thank him for the precious blood. Do it as you are ready.
glory to the Lamb, Steve. And now I want you to lift your hands, close your eyes. You're believing for God to deliver you, to heal you. The presence of the Holy Spirit is what brings liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. As we begin to approach the Lord right now, I want you to lift your hands, close your eyes, and just begin to love him. Come on, right now, watching in your homes around the world, just begin to pray out loud in the Holy Ghost. We thank you, Father. We bless your name. Jesus, we honor you. We honor you. We honor you. Just begin to worship him, worship him, worship him. Precious Holy Spirit, I pray right now you would cause your presence to be felt in that room to be felt in that car to be felt in that hospital room to be felt in that school to be felt in that workplace let that which is present here tangibly flow right through that camera and begin to touch your people now and people of God I want you to look to Jesus Close your eyes and just begin to love him. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. The great I am. The ancient of days. The holy one. He is present now. You don't need to beg. You don't need to plead. You don't need to perform some ritual. You don't need to uncover some hidden mystery. It's time that we begin to address these things from higher places. That peace you're sensing, that joy you're sensing, that's the presence of the Holy Spirit. The power of God is present to heal you. Steve, please sing glory to the Lamb. And as Steve sings, I want you to believe God for a touch of power on your life. Place your hand on that part of your body that you need a healing right now. Hallelujah. 
Place your hand on the part of the body where you need healing. The power of God is about to flow right now. If you need to be set free in your mind, place your hands on your head. Jesus, we honor you. The anointing is present. Your day of torment is coming to an end. Your day of torment is coming to an end. It's not a fight for the Holy Ghost. Jesus, we honor you. Lift your hands and sing it, church. Hallelujah. Where light is, darkness cannot dwell. Where light is, darkness cannot dwell. healing power beginning to flow right now. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's healing virtue. His healing virtue is flowing. Just play it, Ishmael, please. His healing virtue is flowing right now. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we come against every sickness and every disease. In the name of Jesus, I come against every demonic attack on your mind. Right now, we break that power. Listen to me now, those of you who need deliverance. It is not a fight for the Holy Spirit. We've got to get it out of our heads that there's going to be some battle back and forth where the Holy Spirit's trying to push the, the, the attack away or he's trying to push the bondage away and that the enemy can resist him. No, my friend. The power of the Holy Ghost doesn't deal with demonic activity. It dominates that demonic activity. And as attacks are coming against you, I'm telling you right now, the answer is found in the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is not a fight. Stop allowing the enemy to lie to you. Stop allowing the enemy to hype you into an emotional state where you think you have to beg for your freedom. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. Every bondage be broken right now in the mighty name of Jesus. That's the peace of God coming over you. I want you to say this out loud. Say, in the name of Jesus, I am free. Say it boldly. Come on. In the name of Jesus. I am free. Now, Father, let them be filled with your peace. I also pray for healing in the body. Lord, open blind eyes. Open deaf ears, we pray in the name of Jesus. We come against cancer now. We come against sickness and disease. And we agree, God, believing for a touch of your power. Thank you, Lord, that your power is present to heal. Cause bones to be made straight. Cause tendons to be reconnected. Cause nerves to come back online. We rebuke paralysis now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for that healing virtue that's flowing. His power is flowing. Someone right now, someone's left ear has just been open. I give you praise, Jesus. Someone else, there's a cyst on the back of your head. The Lord is healing you. Someone with a severe dental issue, something in the left side of your mouth. God is healing you. I thank you, Lord. Someone else watching, severe nightmares. I'm talking tormenting you don't even want to sleep you haven't been sleeping really i rebuke that torment in the name of jesus the devil has no power over you you're a child of god lord i pray you reveal to your people the power that rests in them by the holy ghost i thank you jesus that power is flowing like a mighty river you don't need me to call out your healing you don't need me to call out your deliverance just believe right now for that power to touch you and make you whole Lord, we rebuke skin disease right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I rebuke issues with movement and issues with pain. Backs be healed, necks be healed, hands be healed, arms be healed, legs be healed, eyes be healed. Every sickness and every disease. Someone watching right now, you had like, um, I don't know if it was allergies or what, something very severe, pressure right up here on the bridge of your nose and pushed back all the way to the back of your throat. You, you've, you've tested it just now, and it just left your body. That's God's healing power touching you. I thank you, Jesus. 
Someone else, uh, I rebuke right now drug addiction in the mighty name of Jesus. Heal them, Lord. Bring healing to their body. I rebuke alcohol addiction, drug dependency of any kind. We break that power right now. Thank you, Lord. We give you the glory and the honor. Just begin to thank him right now for your healing. Thank him right now for your deliverance. The power of God is flowing. I want you to do something for me. If the Lord healed you, whether you're watching live or on replay, I want you to type these simple words. Type, I am healed. If the Lord delivered you, watching live or on replay, type these simple words. I am delivered. Simple words. Let people know what God is doing for you. Lord, we thank you that this virtue is flowing. We thank you for the tangible touch of your power. We give you glory and honor, Jesus. Wow, such a beautiful presence. You sense that peace? That's the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit. The anointing of the Holy Spirit breaks bondages, lifts burdens. He doesn't place burdens, he lifts them. You know, sometimes we get so wrapped up in our own emotions. We become entangled in, in tension and angst. But we just need to have faith. There's a mother watching me right now. You're believing for God to deliver your son. He was once walking with the Lord, but he walked away. And you've been travailing. And there's just been this deep grieving in your heart. Number one, the Holy Spirit's going to bring peace and joy where there is grief. And number two, we come against every attack of the enemy that has been planned against your son. And in the name of Jesus, we declare he will serve the Lord. In fact, I want all of you parents watching right now, claim your children for the gospel. Claim your children for the kingdom. Use their names, speak it out loud. Father, we thank you that you are bringing backsliders home. We thank you that your word does not return void. We honor you. We bless you, Jesus. Such a beautiful presence here. Look at all these testimonies. Steve, I'm reading. I'm reading, and it's coming super fast. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm delivered. I'm delivered. I'm delivered. I'm delivered. Do you see what I'm talking about? There's, it's, it's just the presence of the Holy Ghost. It's just the presence of the Holy Ghost. Like that, he does it. It's his power. It's not man's work. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, we give you all the glory and the honor. And we thank you for what you've done and what only you can do in your power. We honor, we bless you in the name of Jesus. Say it because you believe it. Say, amen. Well, if you've been blessed by this ministry, you've been touched by the power of God, help us reach more people with the power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel message. Consider giving a single gift to this ministry to help us continue our work by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. You can also become a monthly supporter by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. Your gifts, large or small, help us continue with our mission to reach the world, to spread the gospel, to see souls saved, to see people come into the kingdom, salvation, healing, deliverance, empowerment. That's what we're seeing on a mass scale. Be a part of it today. Thank you for your giving. Remember, there's no gift so small that it doesn't count. And there's no gift so large that we wouldn't know how to use it. Everything matters. Support the ministry today. And I want to close tonight by giving God all the glory through song, through worship. Just begin to thank him. Thank him and rejoice in his presence. Thank him and rejoice in your healing. Thank him and rejoice in your deliverance. To God be the glory. Come on, Steve. To God be the glory to God be the glory to God be the glory for the things he has done we sing again to God to God Oh